your Bibles this morning to the book of Exodus chapter 12. And we're going to talk today about the crucifixion of Jesus. Exodus chapter 12. Now, in the book of Exodus chapter 12, we have uh, the Israelites that God is getting ready to miraculously deliver out of Pharaoh's hand. And if you, you know, have studied this at all, then you know that at that time, Egypt was basically the world's superpower. And they were the most powerful nation on the planet. And the Israelites were just slaves uh, to that nation, had no power, no wealth, no anything. And God is getting ready to dynamically deliver them out of this nation's hand. And he does it in such a way that it leaves no room for anybody to question the power of God because he does it in such a miraculous way. So up to this point in Exodus chapter 12, there's been several plagues that have come that really signs to show Pharaoh that in fact he is God and that he needs, that Pharaoh needs to listen to Moses as God's servant and God's uh, the one speaking on God's behalf. But in Exodus chapter 12, something very unique is done. God is getting ready to send a death angel over the Egyptians. And what's going to happen is in the night, the angel is going to visit each home and he's going to take the firstborn male of each family. This is the, this is the final plague that he is sending the final sign that he is sending to the Egyptians. And so he tells the, the Israelites, he says, you're going to be protected from this death angel, and here's how it's going to happen. He tells Moses and Aaron, he says, the people of Israel will be preserved, and they will be preserved by this simple act. They were to select a lamb without spot or blemish. It, it was to have no defects. This was to be done on the 10th day of the month. They were to select the lamb. It had to be perfect, spotless, without blemish. They were to slaughter the lamb. And they were to apply the blood on the doorposts of the home. And he tells them what's going to happen is when this death angel comes, the death angel is going to pass over your home because he sees the blood of that lamb that was put on the doorpost. Then God tells them, you're to celebrate this every year from here forward, and it's going to be called the Passover. Why called the Passover? Because that's exactly what happened. The angel came, and it passed over the home because of the blood. Now, this, of course, is a, it is a sign, and it was a symbol of what was to come. It was a sign and a symbol of the death of Christ and the blood that would be shed on your behalf and that would be applied on your behalf. And that because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and His blood that was shed for you, then you would be delivered from death as well. You would be delivered from spiritual death. We pick this up here in Exodus chapter 12, verse 6. He says, Take special care of these lambs until the evening of the 14th day of the first month. So they're to keep the lambs in their home for four days. He says you're supposed to choose the lamb on the 10th, but then on the 14th day is when it's slaughtered. He says each family in the community must slaughter its lamb on the 14th day. They are to take some of the lamb's blood and smear it on the top and the sides of the door frame of the house where the lamb will be eaten. Skip to verse 12. On that night I will pass through the land of Egypt and I will kill all the firstborn sons and firstborn male animals in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against the gods of Egypt for I am the Lord. The blood that you have smeared on your doorposts will serve as a sign. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And this plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt, but you must remember this day forever. Each year you will celebrate it as a special festival to the Lord. And so the Jewish people still celebrate it today. It's been uh, being celebrated for hundreds and over a thousand years. It's been being celebrated. 
and it was a remembrance of this act. But how many of you know there was more going on there than just the children of Israel being delivered from Pharaoh? Matter of fact, he even says that this is a sign. It is a sign of what? It is a sign of things that were to come. It is a sign, it is a way of them looking forward to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So we pick up here. I want you to turn to Mark chapter 14. Now this is 1,500 years later. So essentially you can say 1,500 Passovers later. <laughs> Quite a many have been celebrated up to this point, Mark chapter 14. But here, Jesus, on the night before he was crucified, is getting ready to celebrate the same Passover meal that God instituted 1,500 years before. He's getting ready to celebrate the same Passover celebration with his disciples. Mark chapter 14, verse 12. It says, on the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? Now, let me tell you something. This in and of itself, right here, is enough to make you a believer. Just the simple fact that God instituted the Passover as a symbol of the death of cross, uh, of the death of Jesus on the cross. And here, 1,500 years later, on the night that the Passover is beginning, is when they come and they arrest Jesus. How can that be? How could that possibly be orchestrated? How could you orchestrate that 1,500 years before, he's going to set up a festival that is to coincide with the exact date that Jesus is going to be captured and taken in for crucifixion? That is an impossibility. Actually, I believe that, that God set the date for the, the Passover, the original Passover in Egypt. I believe he set it to coincide with the, with the night that Jesus would be captured. The reason I believe that and, not, and it not be the other way around is because the Bible actually says in Revelation chapter 13 that he is the lamb who was slain before the foundation of time. Even before time was created, even before man was created, God knew that Jesus would be slain for your sins. And the date, I believe the date was known. I believe the specific time was known. He was slain before the foundation of time. You have to understand that Jesus and, the death, and his death on the cross is the central theme throughout the entire Bible. It runs all the way from Genesis all the way to Revelation. It's all about him and what he did on the cross. And everything, even in the Old Testament, points to the fact that Jesus Christ would be crucified for your sins. Every bit of it. And so even when we were created, before we were created, it's amazing and it's even hard to understand. But God knew that we would sin and that we would rebel against him. And he knew that the only way that we would be restored back to right relationship with him would be through the death of his son on the cross. He knew it before he created us. You see, Adam's sin did not catch God by surprise. He didn't go, oh, shucks. Adam did that, now what are we going to do? He already knew it was going to happen, but he chose to create us anyway because we were that valuable to him. And he already had a plan in place. And it was that Jesus would be the sacrifice for you. The Bible says that your sins, he bore your transgressions upon him for you. So here we are 1,500 years later on the exact date that coincides with the original Passover, 1,500 years later. And now the Passover lamb, who is Jesus, in this instance, is about to be crucified. Verse 13. He sent two of his disciples and he said to them, Go into a city, go into the city, and a man will, carry, will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he himself will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Prepare for us there. And so the disciples went out and came to the city and found it just as he had told him. So they go to this room where the room is already furnished, already set up. They have the Passover meal together. And then... The Passover is 
changed in a way because Jesus implements the Lord's Supper. And from here forward, this is the way that Christians are to celebrate the Passover or because now the, the, the significant event is no longer the Passover. Now the significant event is the death of Christ. So he implements the Lord's Supper right here as, as a way for us to celebrate and commemorate his death. Verse 22, he says, While they were eating, he took some bread. And after blessing it, he broke it and he gave it to them. He said, Take it. This is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for you. And so the Lord's Supper is, in, is instituted. And as you know, when we take communion, we're going to be doing that Saturday night. When we do it, we're actually remembering and honoring the Lord's death. He says, every time you do it, every time you take the Lord's Supper, you're honoring my death, my burial, my resurrection until I return. Why? Because you break the bread and his body was broken for you. You drink the blood, his blood was shed for you. So it's a way of remembering what Jesus did for us. Afterwards, Jesus takes his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. He's about to be arrested, and he knows it. So we pick up here in Mark chapter 15, verse 1. We're going to read a lot of scripture this morning, but I ask you just to bear with me. Mark chapter 15, verse 1, he says, As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered them, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer so that Pilate was amazed. Now after this, Pilate examines Jesus. And he finds that he's not guilty. When you read the other accounts uh, in the Gospels, you can see clearly that Pilate did not want to crucify Jesus. Because he looked at him and said, There's no, this man has done nothing wrong. He examined him. Two or three times he tried to release him. He even tried to, in these verses here, he tried to uh, release Jesus as a prisoner because every year during the Passover, Pilate would release one prisoner to please the people. He tried to make that person Jesus because he believed that Jesus was innocent. But the people said No. We do not want Jesus. We want Barabbas. Barabbas was a murderer. And so they released Barabbas. And Jesus stays. They continue to shout out, crucify him, crucify him. Verse 15. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Now, it's amazing because you read over this in one sentence. Having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. But we know from history and from the other Bible accounts that what that literally meant is that Jesus was flogged or beaten under the Roman tradition with the cat of nine tails, which essentially is a whip that had nine different strands coming off of it, and each of the strands would have had bone, fragments of bone, glass, and lead in that whip. And they would, they would lash their, their prisoners uh, 39 times and so Jesus endured that and he went through that many of you have seen the passion of the Christ where it depicts this that beating that took that took place and you know why is this significant because I think some people look at this and they go well you know Jesus wasn't the only person to ever be beaten Jesus wasn't the only person to ever be crucified matter of fact he was crucified with a thief on either side of him well the difference for us and the reason that it was such a tragedy is because Jesus had done nothing wrong. He had never sinned. He had never done anything to deserve this punishment. Other people that were, that were treated in this way had actually committed uh, crimes and sins. But Jesus had done nothing wrong. He was completely innocent, completely sinless. But more than that, the way I look at it is... Jesus was in heaven. He didn't even have to be here. He didn't even have to come down and take on the form of a servant. He didn't even have to come down and be part of humanity. God never had to institute this plan to begin with. And I tell you what, we would all do well to remember that fact very well. Because I remember 
when I read my Bible and I see how Satan rebelled against God. I see that Satan and his demons were cast out of heaven and they were punished eternally to hell. And guess what? There was no reconciliation for them. God did not prepare a way. He did not send a, a redeemer to redeem. Don't forget that the demons were angels at one time. And with that in mind, that means they were created beings. Just like you and I, God created them. And undoubtedly, God loved them. I believe that God dearly loved His creation, Lucifer, before he, was, before he rebelled and before he was cast down as Satan. I believe that God loved His creation dearly. So Satan and the, and the demons rebelled against God. I believe it broke God's heart. I don't think He was happy about it. That didn't even match God's character. God loved His creation, but yet there was no redemption for them. Now, do you see that we, we don't find ourselves in a much different position here? We are created beings. Our race rebelled against God. He could have punished us just the same as He did the demons, and there could be no restoration, no redemption for us. Don't ever forget that fact. Don't ever think it's something that, you know, we just deserved or that that uh, you know, God would just do because He loved us well. It's true, He does love us, but He loved the demons too. And there was no redemption for them. How many of you are thankful that He decided to redeem us? It was not because you deserved it. None of us could earn it. None of us could do anything about it. But He decided to sacrifice His own Son for you. I'm amazed by that. Because I'm wondering if it were you or me, if I wouldn't have just said, well, let's just put Adam and Eve in there with the demons and let's start over. Let's just create another race that's not going to mess up the way that they did. But he loved us and he could see into the future. He could see you. He could see me. He could see your grandkids. He could see on well into the generations. And he's, he was not willing to sacrifice the relationship with you. And so he sent his son as a redeemer to redeem us. And I've often thought, and maybe many as you have, well, I mean, my goodness, could there have been another way? He's God. You know, did he have to sacrifice his own son? Was that the only way to redeem us? Apparently it was because Jesus asked the same question. If you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, he, he, he looked up to his father, and the book of Mark tells us he prayed this prayer twice. He looked up to God and he said, Father, if there is another way, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, your will be done. So he essentially was asking him, is there another way? If there is, let it happen. Because I'm not willing to go through this. I don't believe he wanted to go through the pain, the physical pain, but I don't believe he wanted to go through the separation with God either because he was about to spend three days in the belly of the earth. Separated from God. The, the book of Mark tells us that having found his disciples asleep, he went back and he prayed the same prayer again. He said, God, if there is another way, if there's another way, if, there, if there's another possibility for us to redeem mankind, if there's another way, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, your will be done. And apparently there was not another way because I don't know of many prayers that Jesus prayed that didn't get answered. Apparently there was not another way. Now, you understand, I understand natural law. You know, the laws of, that man has instituted, government, you know, and, and those types of laws. But we don't fully understand the laws that govern the universe. We don't fully understand the laws that exist in the spiritual world. I don't... You know, I don't know exactly why Jesus had to be crucified and why there had to be a payment for sin. We understand just the idea of justice and that justice had to be served, but still you think, well, he's God. I mean, surely he could bypass that somehow. But apparently there are, there are laws in the spiritual world that God was not willing to break. And that because of our rebellion, there had to be innocent blood. There had to be bloodshed. And Jesus carried your sin, he carried my sin upon that cross with him as the Son of God. And he was crucified on your behalf and mine. 
Verse 16, Mark 15, 16. So after being beaten, the soldiers led him away inside the palace, and they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him, and they began to salute him, Hail of the Jews, Hail, King of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him and they led him out to crucify him. Now this passage here, essentially what's happening is the, the Jewish people, one of the accusations against him was that he had set himself up as king of the Jews, which of course would have been... Uh, rebellion to Caesar because uh, Jerusalem was occupied by Rome at that time so that was one of their accusations against him so the, the guards here are making fun of him for saying that he's a king so they're putting a robe on him they made a thorn out of crown uh, a, a, a crown out of thorns they're shoving it on his head and they're bowing down to him you know they're mocking him for being a king and, and I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking the guy that is hitting him, the guy that is spitting on him, the guy that is making fun of him, he created him. He knows, the Bible, the Bible says, he knows the number of hairs that was on that man's head. From the time he was born till that moment, he knew his whole life, he knew every history, he knew his upbringing, he knew everything about that guard and all the guards that were there. And I'm thinking the humility it must have taken for Jesus not to look at him and say, <laughs> don't you know I created you? I'm about to send a lightning bolt out of heaven and strike you down if you hit me one more time. <laughs> but the humility that it must have taken to subject yourself to someone that you created and that is mocking you and treating you this way. See, it's a whole different level understanding that he was God subjecting himself. It was the creator subjecting himself to the created. That's why Ephesians chapter 2 says that he humbled himself taking on the form of a servant even unto death. Even unto death on the cross. So they're striking him, mocking him, beating him. Verse 21 and they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And there they offered him wine mixed with myrrh. Now, that would have been, myrrh was like a drug. It would have helped to ease the pain. But Jesus refused it. He did not accept it. And so they crucified him, and they divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. So if you remember, it said they had the purple cloak on him, but then they took it off and put his robe back on him, put his clothes back on him. So by this point, when he's getting ready to be crucified, he has his own clothes on. And it says that they, they took him off, and they begin to cast lots for his clothing. The reason that this is so significant is because there is a prophecy found in Psalms chapter 22. Now, now, of course, the book of Psalms was written hundreds of years before Jesus was crucified. If you want to turn there, you can. It's Psalm chapter 22, verse 11. I want to read this prophecy that's found there because it's so significant. Psalms chapter 22, verse 11. We're going to start. It says, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircle me. They have pierced my hands and feet. Now, does that amaze anybody else? Because here it is hundreds of years before that this prophecy is coming forth out of the psalmist David. And it says, 
He says, they pierced my hands and my feet. How many of you know that did not happen to David? <laughs> when you read history, that did not happen to David. This is, he's, this is a prophecy about the crucifixion that's coming. He says, they, pier they have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all of my bones. They stare and gloat over me. And here it is, verse 18. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Hundreds of years later, hundreds of years before, this prophecy was given that, number one, he would be, his hands and his feet would be pierced for you, and that his clothing, they, the guards would take, and that they would, be, they would cast lots. Verse 20, uh, going back to Mark, chapter 15, verse 25. And it was the third hour, which is 9 a.m. be 9 a.m. in the morning. It was the third hour when they crucified him. And the, and the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his left, one on his right. And those who passed by mocked him, wagging their heads and saying, you would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Why don't you save yourself and come down from the cross? So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying he saved others, but he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. You know, that's the... The priests and the scribes that, that said that last line, they said, why don't you come off the cross and prove to us that you're the Son of God and then we will believe. How many of you think they would have believed at that point? What more did they need to believe? I mean, they'd seen him raise people from the dead, open the blind eyes. But yet, they're saying, yeah, but this one more thing. Let us see you come off the cross, and then we'll believe. They wouldn't have believed. Because their hearts were hardened, and their hearts were darkened. And even if he had come off the cross, they still would not have believed. They would have explained it away in some way. Because their hearts were wicked. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. Of course, the book of John tells us that one of the thieves on the cross actually received salvation glory to God verse 33 and when the sixth hour had come which would be noon there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour so it's right in the middle of the day it's noon but darkness covers the whole land and at the ninth hour which would be 3 p.m. Jesus cried with a loud voice Eloi Eloi Lima Sebaktahani which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling for Elisha. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine. They put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Let us wait and see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. So we read from all the accounts, all the Bible accounts, all the gospel accounts, that what took place in this last moment is that Jesus, when he breathed his last, that there was, a, there was a sort of earthquake that took place. There was a great shaking, a great rumbling that took place. And it says that the curtain which separated the Holy of Holies in the temple was torn in two. Now, we read from history that this curtain was approximately two feet thick. And on the other side of the curtain in the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. And as many of you know... Only the high priest could enter there. It wasn't the common person or the average person that had access to the presence of God. Actually, if anyone else other than the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, then they would be killed instantly because of the presence of God and they were not allowed in there. And so the priest, in that way, he went to God for the people. The people did not have a direct relationship with God. They had to go through a priest to get to God. One of the significant things about the death on the cross 
is that a priest is no longer our mediator. Jesus himself is our mediator. It, it, Jesus himself is the mediator between God and man. The book of Hebrews explains this to us. Actually, the book of Hebrews explains clearly that to go back to the old system of a priest is actually nullifying the, the purpose of the death on the cross. And that by doing that, you make the work of the cross none effect because what happened on the cross is that the curtain, the veil was torn, meaning what that symbolizes is that now every man has access into the presence of God. Every person has access into the, in the presence of God. And if you read the book of Hebrews, one of the things that it says is that now we can all come boldly into the throne room of grace. We can obtain mercy and we can find grace to help in time of need. Because he purchased it with his own blood. Amen. The last passage that I want to read this morning is found in Isaiah chapter 53. Turn in your Bibles with me to Isaiah chapter 53. This was another prophecy. This is probably the most well-known prophecy about the death of Christ. And this prophecy was written 700 years before Christ was born. Isaiah 53, we're going to begin in verse 1. Now as we read this prophecy, I want you to, I want you to imagine the cross. I want you to imagine that scene because this is what it's speaking about here. In Isaiah 53, 1, he says, Who has believed what they heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of the dry ground. He's talking about Jesus. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he, was, he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. That verse 4, what that means is that when, when man saw him being punished, they took it as God is punishing him because he is not doing right in the sight of God. Little did man know that, yes, God was the one uh, uh, punishing him, but he was punishing him for you. Not because of anything that he had done, but because of what we had done. So it says, we esteemed him stricken by God and afflicted. Verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. All like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep before his shears is silent, he opened not his mouth. You remember Pilate asking him, Are you not going to answer? Are you not going to? Give an excuse, are you not going to answer these accusations against you? It says he just remained silent so much that it amazed Pilate. Verse 8, by oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. Verse 9, and they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence. You remember Joseph of Arimathea, who was a very wealthy man took the body of Jesus and purchased his grave, which makes perfect sense with verse 9, because he says, with a rich man, he made his grave with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He, was put, he has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for sin. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted as righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. 
Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Now, when you read that, that describes the death of Jesus to a T. Not only what happened physically, but also what was taking place spiritually. But yet this book of the Bible, Isaiah chapter 53, was written 700 years before Jesus was ever even born. Why is that significant? Well, it's significant because we live in a day and age when people would like to say that Jesus was not the Son of God and that he was just a good teacher and we ought to follow his principles and his teachings about loving your neighbor, blah, blah, blah. But they don't believe that he was the Son of God. They don't believe that he died as the Son of God and it paid for your sin. They don't believe that he was resurrected three days later. But let me tell you something. Believing that Jesus was a good teacher cannot produce salvation in your life. Believing that Jesus was a good man or a prophet cannot produce salvation in your life. There's only one thing that can produce salvation in your life, and it's believing that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, that He died for your sins, and that He was resurrected three days later. You know, if you get to heaven, and you're standing there, and I doubt God asked this question, but if you're standing there and God asks you, why should I let you into heaven? Don't start going through your works. Because I've already seen what happens to those people in the book of Matthew. He said, but Lord, in your name we cast out many devils. In your name we did this, that, and the other. And he said, I never knew you. Why? Because good works does not save a person. If you're standing there and he asks you, why should I let you into my heaven? Do not start going through your works. The first thing you need to do is say, the only reason that I should be allowed to come into your presence is because of the blood of your son that was shed on my behalf. Because the only reason we have access into his presence is the fact that Jesus Christ took your sin he paid for them on the cross. That is the only reason that you have access into the presence of God. It is the only reason that we are in right relationship with him today. And I'll tell you what, even as a Christian, you got to be careful not to fall into this trap of thinking that somehow you're more right with God than somebody else because you do stuff. Because you pray more, or you give more, or you attend church more faithfully. Listen, none of that makes you more right with God than the next person. It does not make you more right with God as far as salvation is concerned. Now, we don't have time to get into this morning, but a person's life can please God more than another person. Let me give you an example. For example, I have children. We all have children. And when one of my children obey my will more than the other, they might be more pleasing to me in that moment than the other child. But they're not, they don't have a higher status with me as a son or a daughter. So no matter what they do, they're still my, he's still my son or she's still my daughter. And they cannot do anything to earn that. And that's where we're at with God. Don't ever think that you're less righteous in God's sight or that you're less right with Him than another person because of what you do. If you put your faith in the blood of Jesus and you believe that His death paid for your sin, then the Bible declares you righteous. And one of the things we read in, in Isaiah 53, I'm not going to go back and try to find it, but you'll remember we read this. Essentially what it was saying is that we could not we could not accomplish the law we could not make ourselves right with God and so he put it upon Jesus I like to say it this way P people love to say well salvation can't be earned salvation cannot be earned actually salvation is earned but the difference is it was earned by Jesus he earned it by living a holy life it did have to be earned. See, and everybody under the law was trying to earn it, but they couldn't. They couldn't earn it. In the Old Testament, they could not earn it. They could never do it right. They always messed up. But Jesus came, and he fulfilled law perfectly. He lived it perfectly, and, then, and, and by that sense, he did earn salvation, but he earned it for you. His, you know, people say, well, 
Well, when did we actually become saved? Was it at the death or was it at the resurrection? Well, I believe it began in his life because it started when he began to live perfectly and holy in the sight of God. Because if he had sinned, if he had made, if he had, if he had sinned, if he had, you know, given in to his flesh like every one of us have, which he could have done, if he had sinned, then he would not have been the perfect spotless sacrifice that was required. It started from the time he was born until the time he was resurrected. It all had to be perfect, and he did it. And the most amazing thing is that he did not do it for himself. He did it for you. He did it for me. Glory to God, are you thankful for it? <laughs> My goodness, I am so thankful. I thank him for it every day. I think every time I stand in this pulpit, I probably pray, pray a similar prayer, and it's not out of repetition. I'm praying it because every time I pray it, I mean it. I say, God, I do not want to take for granted what you did on the cross. I do not want to take it for granted. I understand that I'm in right relationship with you because of what your son did. It's not because of my own works. It's not by the blood of goats and calves, the Bible says, but it's because of his blood, which was obtained for us once and for all because he entered the holy place and he obtained eternal redemption for us. Isn't it great that he, hadn't, he doesn't have to die over and over again? It's an eternal sacrifice. It's eternal throughout all of eternity. He doesn't have to die over and over again. It's an eternal sacrifice for you and me.